on a spaceship. We're on a tiny, tiny spaceship moving at the whim of the universe. And when we go outside and look up, you're part of it. That is our home. I think people hundreds of years ago were fascinated by what was beyond the oceans. Now we've, we've found what's beyond there. Now it's sort of what's, what's beyond the moon, what's beyond the planets, what's beyond the solar system. chemical ingredients in our bodies. All of this was forged inside of stars billions of years ago, exploded out in space, recoagulated here, and the Earth was formed, and we were formed from it. We are literally made of star material. And by looking out in space, we are looking back into time, into a time capsule back there. We're literally seeing our origins. We are seeing ourselves. West longitude mark one of the premier sky watching spots on Earth, San Diego, California. In this southwesternmost corner of the United States, clear skies and stable air offer endless access to the wonders of the night sky, from comets, eclipses, and the planets of our solar system to constellations, stars, and the galaxies beyond. The fact of the matter is that astronomy is the most accessible of all sciences. The entire laboratory is right outside your back door. You just go outside and look up. And I think most people get very excited when they start to realize that, that we are not only part of the universe, but we can go outside and actually see it and observe it, and even more importantly, understand it. If the stars would appear one night in a thousand years, how men would believe and adore and preserve for many generations the remembrance. But every night come out these envoys of beauty and light the universe with their admonishing smile. Ralph Waldo Emerson. I guess one of the things that gets people really jazzed up about what's going on up there is the fact that they are actually part of it. They can actually go outside and see these things. You know, there's, there's hardly one phenomenon in the universe that you can name that you cannot see from your backyard. With a naked eye, with binoculars, with a small telescope, virtually every single phenomenon there is in the universe is accessible. To observe the night sky, what we need is a clear, dark place which isn't too windy where the air is nice and stable the first thing i would suggest people do is get a star chart at a planetarium at a science museum at an observatory someplace and go outside in their backyard and look up just look up and try to identify things this is what an astronomer does an astronomer asks questions and then proceeds to answer them so you start off by being an astronomer say I wonder what that star is I wonder what that star grouping is go to your star chart find it identify it you have become an astronomer have you ever wondered why the stars twinkle at night well believe it or not the stars twinkle not because the stars themselves are twinkling the stars are actually great globes of gas, hydrogen gas, burning in a thermonuclear nuclear fusion process trillions of miles away. They're not twinkling, they're shining as steadily as the sun. Now during the daytime, the sunlight comes down, heats the surface of the Earth. At night, that heat has to go somewhere. So it rises up through the atmosphere, sending these great big columns of convection cells up into the atmosphere. We are looking through that turbulence, and we are seeing the stars waver around. Now if you were standing in space, looking at the star field, you would see absolutely sharp pinpoints of light. Would look very much like this. But remember, here on the Earth, heat rises from the surface of the Earth every night. 
So we're going to simulate the rising heat coming off of the surface of the Earth with this flame bar. Now, when you look through this column of rising air, you see the stars twinkling. Now, you may also notice that some stars don't twinkle at all. Probably one of the planets of our solar system. It's very difficult to portray the solar system in any sort of physical model because of two reasons. One is that the innermost planet, Mercury, is about 100 times closer than the outermost planet, which is Pluto. So that's, that's rather difficult to portray even in a drawing on a single page. Uh, the other thing is, is that the sizes of the planets are very small compared to the sun. Let's start. Let's inflate the sun. What we're doing here is making a model of the solar system. What we're going to do is shrink the solar system by a factor of 200 million. Make everything in the solar system 200 million times smaller. We're going to start walking from the sun and walk out toward various planets. And we're not going to be able to visit all the planets because if we were to do that, it would take us five and a half hours. I don't think you have that much time today. But let's get started. If we take the solar system and shrink it so that it's 200 million times smaller than it really is, then that means that if I take a step, my step spans 100,000 miles. And if I move at walking speed, I'm walking at 186,000 miles per second. And that's the speed of light. Now let's see how long it takes me, being a light beam, to cross the sun. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. It takes about five seconds to cross the sun. We've been walking for three minutes, and we've gone about 1,000 feet down the beach. And here's Mercury, a one-inch jawbreaker. Here's our next stop. We're a third of a mile down the beach, or six minutes worth of walking, and this is Venus. This is our third stop. We've been walking for eight minutes. That means that light takes eight minutes to reach the Earth. Now, light travels very fast, 186,000 miles per second, and on its journey over eight minutes, it spans the distance between the sun and the Earth. And that is equivalent to 93 million miles. Here's Mars, 13 minutes from the sun. Here's massive Jupiter, 43 minutes from the sun. Jupiter's so big that about 1,400 Earths would fit into it. OK, there's a ringless Saturn. How many rings? Well, as many as you want to count. OK, there's Uranus, also known as Uranus. Right? Okay, here's Neptune, just a little bit smaller than Uranus. We're almost all the way out now. When you get out to the distance of Pluto, light has traveled from the sun about five and a half hours to get to that point. Now, the stars are incredibly far away, it's really hard to imagine. If you could follow a light beam out from the sun past Pluto, you'd have to continue more than four years beyond that at light speed in order to reach the distance to the nearest star. And it would take you 30,000 years traveling on that light beam to get to the center of our galaxy. It's called the Milky Way galaxy. Astronomy compels the soul to look upwards and leads us from this world to another, Plato. Astronomers are kind of like detectives. We're trying to figure out what's going on. Where did we come from? How did the sun and the planets form? The invention of the telescope really enabled human beings to explore the universe. And telescopes still today provide us with a new way to investigate the far reaches of the universe. The basic works of a, of a reflecting telescope is, was designed by Isaac Newton. And what we have is a concave mirror, which is precisely polished, that reflects light from the sky and concentrates it to a point. Uh, you have a deflecting mirror, flat, 
to take it to an angle, and then we use an eyepiece to amplify the image that is formed by that mirror. A lot of people think that a telescope's purpose is to magnify light from the stars so we can see more. That's not the purpose of a telescope. The purpose of a telescope is very simple. Gather light. That's it. Very simple. You have a telescope in your eyes. They gather light. And the bigger the telescope is, the more light you can gather. And the more light you gather, the more you can see. They are, in effect, light buckets. The bigger the light bucket, the more photons of light we collect. So we like to have big telescopes. The difference between a small reflecting telescope and a professional telescope like Mount Palomar, 200 inches in diameter, the principle is, is exactly the same. Nothing has changed. The 200-inch Hale Telescope at Palomar Observatory, northeast of Escondido, does far more than gather light for eager eyes. In the last five decades, it has made more astronomical discoveries than any other Earth-based telescope. The 200-inch telescope is actually very similar to telescopes that astronomers, amateur astronomers all over the country use. It's only a lot bigger, and it has fancier instrumentation on it as well. The Hale Telescope first came into use in 1948. Uh, that was the first light dedication. It actually started construction in the 30s and was delayed a little bit by, uh, by the war. Even though the telescope is almost 50 years old now, uh, advances in uh, instrumentation and detectors, that, the instruments that we use on the telescope have uh, significantly improved what we can study with the same telescope. The initial way that the telescope was used was putting a photographic plate at the focus, exposing the photographic plate, taking it downstairs, developing it, and then seeing what you got only actually many hours later in some cases. Now we use entirely electronic detectors. So we have things like spectrographs with electronic detectors. We have entirely electronic imagers. We actually don't even sit in the dome itself. We sit down in an observing room where we can stay a little bit warmer. Uh, we, can, we see all of our images come up on a computer screen. We operate the telescope from within there as well, and it, it uses computers to very accurately point it in the sky. What we see when we look at very faint galaxies is we see the light from the galaxy as it was many billions of years ago. One fascinating thing about looking at these very faint galaxies is we're seeing light from these galaxies before even our own sun was formed. And we can get an idea of what our own origin, the origin of our own galaxy and solar system and so forth are by studying how these very distant objects formed. So we're seeing traces of light from the very early history of the universe and uh, get some idea for, uh, for where galaxies and stars and so forth came from. What Galileo saw through his telescope changed the whole concept on how the universe has evolved. The sky is common to everyone. So in this sense, we have uh, a whole universe to look after. The constellation Orion has long been a favorite starting place for amateur astronomers. Orion is, I think, one of my favorite constellations because it is so bright and so obvious and so easy to see. I remember seeing that when I was just a, a very small child and I had no idea what it was, but I recognized the shape. When you go outside and you look at Orion, one corner, the upper left-hand corner, is a sort of an orangish star, and that's a star known as Betelgeuse. And Rigel is down in his other knee in the, on the lower right-hand corner. But if you take a look at those two stars, and if you're not colorblind, you will actually see that Betelgeuse has a kind of a reddish-orange color. Rigel has a bluish-white color. So when you take a look at the nighttime sky, you can actually see colors in the stars. But what do those colors actually mean? Well, you can tell the temperatures of the stars by their colors. All you have to do is look up and see them. A reddish star, like Betelgeuse, for example, is a much cooler star than a bluish-white star like Rigel. By taking the torch and heating up the titanium, you'll actually be able to see the color of the metal change, very much like the color of a star. Now, while the temperature of the titanium is very hot by our standards, by celestial standards, it's really rather cool. A star of this temperature would be about 3,000 or 4,000 degrees. By firing the welding torch up and touching it to the metal, you're going to see the color change very differently than it did before. Now it's going to become white hot. First it glows deep orange, now much hotter.
Lunar eclipses are one of the most common astronomical phenomena that or many people can observe very easily, just out in the backyard on a night when the moon should be full. One can go out at night when the Earth and the moon and the sun line up just perfectly, and while the moon doesn't become completely dark, it becomes significantly less bright than when it's outside of the Earth's shadow. A lunar eclipse occurs when the moon moves through the shadow of the Earth. Now, the moon's orbit around the Earth isn't lined up perfectly with the Earth's orbit around the sun. But on very special occasions when the, the orbits intersect, then the moon passes directly through the shadow. Lunar eclipses occur every few years, as viewed from any point on the Earth. In a way, it's like exploring. I think people hundreds of years ago were fascinated by what was beyond the oceans. And, and now we've, we've found what's beyond there. Now it's sort of what's, what's beyond the moon, what's beyond the planets, what's beyond the solar system. I think it gives us a sense of our spaceship that we're riding on, spinning around the, that object that just went down over there, the horizon, and just sort of gives us a better perspective on the Earth. Humans are just eternally curious, which I think is one, one thing that, that makes us human is this insatiable curiosity. Eclipse is a frightening spectacle. Those who become aware of it may think the sun or moon is dying. Isaac Asimov. Formed during the origin of the solar system, some 4.6 billion years ago, comets are mostly frozen water and dust. Warmed by the sun, after thousands of years in the deep freeze of outer space, comets develop enormous tails of glowing vapor. In 1996 and 97, two conspicuous comets, Hayakutake and Hale-Bopp, graced the night skies over San Diego. Discovered by two astronomers, one amateur and one professional simultaneously, Hale-Bopp was last seen by the ancient Egyptians over 4,000 years ago and won't return for another 2,000 years. A comet is really a remarkably simple object. It's essentially a frozen snowball that's filled with dirt, a dirty snowball. We're going to actually make a comet right here with some ordinary household ingredients. We'll start with some water. We're going to take two cups of water, pour it into a bowl, lined with a plastic garbage bag, to the water, we're going to add some dirt, a little bit of ammonia, just a drop or two of corn syrup, and we're going to add two cups of dry ice. Dry ice is simply frozen carbon dioxide. That's really all it is. We squeeze it together, crushing the comet into a great big snowball. When we reveal it, we will see what a comet nucleus looks like. But if you take a look at it, you can see that there is gas boiling off of this, and very, very closely you can see little jets of material coming off. This is what a comet nucleus actually does. A comet's tail is essentially this gas and some of the dust falling off of the comet nucleus, but being blown away from the comet by the solar wind. Instead of just being beautiful objects in the sky, I now see comets as forces that could plow into the Earth and even change the course of life here. David Levy on Comet Shoemaker-Levy's collision with Jupiter. Comets hold a special fascination for all of us, but kids at the Challenger Learning Center east of San Diego in La Mesa are on a mission to rendezvous with a comet. The Challenger Center is one of 29 sites worldwide that links space exploration with academic learning. Since 1992, over 60,000 kids have participated in these exciting space launches. The Challenger Center is one of those institutions which allows you to become an astronaut for a day. 
You learn something about the science that goes on in space and how it all has to come together. And I think that's one of the most important things about the Challenger Center, and that is that we learn to work as team members. We learn how organized a space mission really is. Phoenix, this is Mission Control. The message for the medical team is we are ready to record your data. You may begin testing. Over. It's a place where you learn to do the work that an astronaut does. Mission Control, this is Phoenix. We copy. Over and out. The kids on board the orbiting space station, along with their teammates at Mission Control, work together to guide their spacecraft toward a comet. Then they launch a space probe into the comet's tail. These young minds are immersed in the fun of astronomy and space exploration. All teams may have your full attention. All teams, your navigation team has just discovered Halley's Comet in our nose star field. They're going to change course now. They're ready to aim for the comet. We have located Halley's Comet. In our personal lives, we journey from ignorance to knowledge. The exploration of the cosmos is a voyage of self-discovery. Carl Sagan. Someday it will affect your life in some way. You might not even realize it, but it will influence you. I personally am much more understanding of what goes on in the world around me, much more tolerance of the humans that I am with, because I understand that we are part of a much greater system of things. We are a microcosm of all that is. Everything is connected. People are interested in, in really where did we come from? Are we alone or are there other civilizations? A fascinating question. And that goes all the way back to the Earth, the Sun, the origins of, of, of this whole thing that, that, that we see. We are on a spaceship. We're on a tiny, tiny spaceship moving at the whim of the universe. And when we go outside and look up, we're part of it. That is our home. Our time may be remembered chiefly for one fact. This was the age when the inhabitants of the Earth first made contact with the cosmos around them. Carl Sagan.